more weeks with us. And he's going to tell us today also some part of the community uh, about the sustainability and the other some of the other things. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I will be talking about something like the regulators, and I would like to convince you of the fact that they are multi-stable and excitable. And <laughs> and the main focus of my talk will be more theoretically theoretical, but I will also show some experiments that have been done in our group in Brussels. Uh, and compare it to the two. So semiconductor relays are nothing else than just regular semiconductor lasers where the gain medium is just the semiconductor material and the resonator of the laser is now in this case a ring-shaped waveguide so the light is trapped inside of this ring and the blazing light just circulates around in this ring. And so in order to couple some of this light out, if you want to measure the output, what we do is you've got a bus waveguide that you bring close and you've got evanescent wave coupling, and so you can measure some of the light that's coming out of this ring. So this is a sketch, of course. If we take a look at the real device that are fabricated in Glasgow University, they look something like this. And in a very natural way, due to the circular symmetry of the ring laser, you've got two directional modes. You've got a clockwise mode and a counterclockwise mode. And interesting is, and the reason why many researchers were interested in studying this device, is the fact that it can be uh, bistable. So in other words, you can have the clockwise mode that is lazy, so that has the most intensity, or you can have the counterclockwise mode that is lazy in one direction. So this is also this bi-stability is a, a main first motivation for many people to study these type of devices because due to this bi-stability they can serve as optical memories and due to the architecture of a ring laser they are potentially uh, you can integrate them on a chip and that is a reason why many people are interested in that. So how does this work? If you've got a ring laser and you're just assuming that it's uh, operating in let's say the clockwise mode, then you've got output that encodes for instance for a zero. But if you then address the input at the side one, you can force the laser to switch its uh, direction of operation. Also at the output now, you've got it, the laser encoding this uh, the one. And important is that if you remove this input, then if you, as long as you keep on thumping the laser, it retains this information and it stores it and we will uh, keep on encoding for it again. Yeah. You just mentioned the two clockwise and counterclockwise mode. What about longitudinal modes in, in these lasers? Good point. They, they, they been often uh, exist, but the lasers that we consider for experiments have been measured to be single longitudinal modes. So what I will be talking about... And they stay like that? Under. They stay like that okay. forever. So throughout, uh, throughout the entire talk, I will be always considering single longitudinal modes. Mm -hmm. How do you achieve that? Because it's too very short? Or are you Sorry? How do you achieve being being the Yeah, it's, it's because of the size and the phase change. So it it's, it's not smaller than another fiber of devices. So that's why I'm asking. So both situations can occur. Both situations can occur, but the, the devices we we have have been measured to be always something a little bit more. In any case, yeah. Um, so if we're interested in if people are interested in optical memory <coughs> and stability. We wanted to study uh, in which regions of a uh, device, uh, for parameter space of the device, you can have bi stability and what determines the bi stability in the ring laser. So that's the first motivation. Uh, secondly, is uh, the fact that due to the circular symmetry and the Z2 symmetry of the ring laser, it can serve as an optical prototype for a very general class of systems, all the, the, the class of systems that share the same Z2 symmetry. And Quite straightforward, you've got the micro disc lasers which have clearly the same circular symmetry. So the dynamics I will talk about in, uh, in this talk will be very easily transferable to micro disc lasers. On the other hand, it can, might also be useful for pixels because if you look at the, the SFM model for, circle, uh, for two modes of circular polarized light, it has been shown in this uh, work that can be reduced to exactly the same a set of equations that I will use in throughout this talk. So all the dynamics that I study and bifurcations in for the ring laser can possibly be useful for pixels as well. And then if you consider interaction between transverse modes in CO2 laser that has been shown to have the same kind of set 2 symmetry, but you can also have it not only in laser systems, but for instance in fluid mechanics if you've got uh, convection problems in a finite container, you can have the same symmetry and you can 
finding several other examples. So from a general point of view, it's interesting to study these green lasers and do some experiments on that, and you can uh, get some information for other systems as well. So if you want to start looking at uh, the dynamics that goes on in such green lasers, an easy first thing to do is to go to, uh, to do an experiment and to measure a PI curve, so power in function of the pump current on the laser, and then you can see that at a certain uh, point, threshold is reached, and the laser starts lasing, and both modes, shown in white and in black, the clockwise and the counterclockwise mode, they start emitting equal amounts of intensity. That's what often called bidirectional region of operation. And then if you increase the pump current at a certain point here, you get symmetry breaking, so that one mode suppresses the other mode and has much less intensity than in the other mode. So that's the unidirectional region of operation, where all the energy is in one certain direction, and moreover, it's not just unidirectional, but this is also the region of bi-stability. So depending on the initial conditions, it can also be the other way around. So also the other mode can have much more intensity than the other mode. Okay. If we want to model this type of behavior, there are several ways to approach the, such a problem. And the first uh, method is to model the electric field at all points in the ring. So that would be a traveling wave approach, which is more correct but it's also numerically more, uh, more challenging. So that's why we prefer to uh, stick to a general rate equation approach because I will show you later that it allows us to, to get more analytical results and to get overall in parameter space uh, a good insight into what's happening in the laser. So we use a general rate equation model describing the slowly varying envelopes of the electric fields of both counter-propagating modes and we've got one equation for the carrier density or the carrier. Um, what you have is a model, you've got the modal gain terms, which are where the gain is saturated not only by its own intensity, but also by the intensity of the counter propagating mode. And you've got here a term where you have a linear coupling between both modes uh, with a certain strength k and with a certain phase, a linear coupling phase phi k. And this can, for instance, be due to reflections here at the coupler, but also distributed reflections. The, the reflections at the output that couple back into the counter propagating mode, but we all lump that together. Oh, we all lump that together into one general term. And then here, of course, you've got the pump current. Uh, what yeah. do you assume for S and C? How do they compare? So, so the cross saturation is always larger than the self saturation in this. Um, it's in it, general. It's a good, good question. Uh, just due to the interference pattern that you, you always get, well, the, the, the cross is always, it's more, mostly twice the self uh, separation. I can write, we can look at it later. Uh, but that's an interesting comment because it's very important for the dynamics that I show you. And if I mentioned earlier that you've got this, the same model for, uh, for pixels, it is true, but it's exactly the opposite for the saturation here coefficients. So everything I will talk uh, about here is for ring lasers. And the exact <coughs> same applications occur for pixels, but just with the opposite stability. So everything is just reverse instability. Um, so we, we thought this uh, general rate equation model was uh, still a bit too complex, so we did a multiple time scale analysis. And that showed us that on a slow time scale, the total power is conserved. And using this conservation law, we got to this two-dimensional system that describes the dynamics of the, of the ring laser. And we've got two new variables, theta and psi, where theta is related to uh, the relative intensity between both modes, and psi is nothing else than the phase difference between both the modes. Um, so, what you mean yeah. on these low time scales, you mean that in the fast dynamics, that is vibrating? Absolutely. Yeah. So, this this uh, mo model is only valid on slow time scale, so that means that all the dynamics I will describe in this talk is only well described by such a model on this slow time scale, more particularly slower than the typical relaxation frequency. I read this, uh, the frequency of the relaxation oscillations in the laser. And the main parameters that are important in this, uh, in this model and that we'll play with are phi k, which is the, the, the linear coupling phase between both of the modes and a renormalized pump current. And in fact, in this renormalized pump current, you've got a difference between the saturation coefficients, which means that if 
the self-saturation or cross-saturation is larger or smaller, you will invert the pump current and due to symmetry of this model, it corresponds to an inversion of stability. Anyhow, so this is the model I will mainly be working with. And just to here to a short uh, wrap up of that, we've got the, the five dimensional system in the beginning, the full rate equation model, and then uh, after the, the analysis, we got to this two dimensional model. Also, you've got a greatly reduced parameter space in this, uh, in this case, and it more explicitly shows this at two symmetry that it is really at the basis of, uh, of the ring laser. So, which, which parameters does it here? So what you have here is the, the self and the cross saturation. The difference between them is now hidden in the renormalized pump current. And as well, the linear coupling strength between both modes is also a scaling in the, in, in the normalized current. And that's interesting because it tells us that, for instance, if the coupling between both modes is very strong, the infinity goes to infinity. Uh, it's very strong, the, the renormalized pump current goes to zero. and that will. Uh, I'll show you later that will correspond to bidirectional operation. But, if I, mm -hmm. but does it mean you would not be able to individually uh, change the, the coupling rates and uh, the cross saturation and self saturation rates no more? No. So because you say all okay. enters just in J? Absolutely. Well, from a slow time scale dynamical point of view, this wouldn't matter. You would just be shifting in the, the pump current and the dynamics will be the same. It will just happen at different uh, pump currents for the laser these parameters change. That's true, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so what we did is to take this model and do a bifurcation analysis. And so what I'm showing here in parameter space, in, this, uh, in the parameter space defined by the normalized pump current and this linear coupling phase are all the bifurcations that occur. And the local bifurcations we can calculate analytically because it's just a two-dimensional system. And the global bifurcation we calculated numerically. But I'm not going to go into detail into all these bifurcations. What I'd just like to do with you is to look at just a cut which corresponds to a certain linear coupling phase. So if we look at this cut here, you get a bifurcation diagram which looks something like this. I'm showing theta, so the relative modal intensity in function of the renormalized pump current. And the black lines are stable solutions and the white lines are unstable solutions. So what you can see is that for low values of the, the pump current, you have theta zero, which corresponds to bidirectional operation. So both modes have equal amounts of intensity. And that's what I meant with the normalization of the pump current. So for instance, if the linear coupling strength is very strong, the normalized current goes to zero. So it immediately gives a feeling about what's happening, what, what, what the relevance is of that parameter. If you increase the pump current, at a certain point you get an instability, uh, and which leads to the formation of a stable limit cycle. In that case, you've got anti-phase oscillations between both of these modes. And then, if you increase the current even further, you've got two stable unidirectional solutions. So that's just a clockwise and a counterclockwise lazy mode and the bistability that we mentioned earlier. And the way you go from these oscillations to the bistable region is by, uh, well, by creating these asymmetric solutions or unidirectional solutions in a pitch for bifurcation they get stabilized in the subcritical of bifurcation, then they form a large unstable limit cycle in homoplating bifurcation, and then all oscillations disappear in the fold of cycles, for those who are interested in that. <laughs> okay, so and this five you call homoplating, is that a gluing? That's a gluing bifurcation in, because of the symmetry in this case, absolutely. Uh, oh yeah, I had your small picture to remi remind you of the, the experimental curve where you, you're at the bidirectional and the unidirectional region, so you can model that quite well. And the re reason why you don't see here these oscillations, you do see it on the scope, but on average, this is averaged out, so that's why you don't see it in the PI curve. So, okay, that was one. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. What kind of oscillations are those? Because you said you have eliminated uh, more or less the fast time scales. Absolutely, they're, they're on the megahertz range. So 10 megahertz, that's the, 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 the frequency of these type, type of oscillations. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, well, the, the relaxation oscillations would be more like gigahertz. So that you threw that out, but you retain these type of oscillations. And what is the time scale or the both oscillations coming from? Is it coming in size or what is the... Well, yep. this is um, good question. Um, I think it's the 
linear coupling uh, strength that that's, uh, that's uh, determines that. We can write down the, uh, the equation for this frequency. I should check that. Uh, I can do that for you later. If you want. So if we look at a different cut, uh, well, you get a qualitatively different picture. Just for comparison, I repeat the picture we saw earlier. Um, again, I'm showing theta in function of the renormalized current. And interesting to see is again, and this is always the same for the ring laser, that for low values of the current, you've got bidirectional operation. For high values of the current, you've got this bistability. That's always the same. So what changes is for intermediate values of the pump currents. Previously, you, you had all these bifurcations. Well, now you've got here a, a tri-stability between the two unidirectional solutions and a bidirectional solution. So you've got three stable states. And you've got a similar multi-stability in, in the other case that I didn't mention explicitly. And that's where you've got two stable unidirectional solutions that coexist with a stable limit cycle. And these type of uh, regions of multi-stability were previously not observed in the, in the ring laser. And as far as I know, it's not very common to have it in, in regular lasers either. So that's why we were quite interested in that. And we went to the experiment and tried to look for that. So what this is uh, our device that we've got. We put a pump current on it. We drive it into lasing. And we couple out the lights and we collect it through the fiber to see what's going on. Now the problem with such these devices is that you get them after the fabrication process, and in principle you can't really control well the, the linear coupling strength, the linear coupling phase, because it's determined by the process. So in order to play around with that a bit, uh, what we do is we uh, reflect part of the light on the fiber and we couple it back into the kind of propagating mode. And then by moving the fiber slightly, we can change the phase of the linear coupling and by putting a waveguide current on the, on, on, on the waveguide, to reduce the absorption, we can play around a bit with uh, the strength of the linear coupling. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. So for, for the bidirectional situation, um, do you assume that these, or we find in your model, that these two modes are uh, frequency locked, are coupled, or is that operation where they just uh, emit independently? Because for some example, there will be frequency, sh in an experiment, there will be frequency shifted. So in the bidirectional operation, do they just uh, operate independently, or are they locked to each other? They're locked. They have the same frequency. The frequency lock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, so that's what we did, and we get then these type of uh, time traces. So on the top, I show here time traces for increasing <coughs> pump currents, and the top line is for a certain value of the coupling phase, qualitatively speaking, and the bottom line is for a different value of the of the coupling phase. So if you look at the first picture, and we just look at a zoom, what you get in time is that you clearly have three stable states, and you jump through, through spontaneous emission noise, you jump from one stable solution to the other. So you've got this tri-stability that we predicted, and first you had the bidirectional operation, of course, and I cut that off. So you've got this tri-stability, and theoretically what you expect is that the bidirectional solution, the basin of attraction, it will shrink as you increase the pump current. So what, this is also what you can see. If you increase the pump current, this bidirectional solution will become less and less present until finally it disappears and you're left with the bistable operation that you expect. So we were quite happy with that. And then we, if you change the coupling phase, what you get is the bidirectional operation, but then it destabilizes. You get these type of oscillations, these alternate oscillations in time. And then if you increase the pump current even further, you still have these oscillations. It's a bit packed here, so you can't see it that well, but these are very regular oscillations if you zoom in. But you also have resonances in, let's say, the top and the bottom state, which corresponds to the two uh, unidirectional regions of operation. So here you've got this multi-stability and the coexistence between the stable <coughs> limit cycle and the two stable states. And then increasing the pump current even further, this, these oscillations they disappear, and you're left again with the bi-stability. So, uh, in principle, this is just <coughs> uh, our theoretical predictions. And what I would like to focus on now is, is this last picture, where you, after all these oscillations and this uh, multi-stable region, you're left with a purely bi-stable uh, operation. But if we take a closer look to that, what you can see is that if you look at a time trace, you just have the regular mode hops from one state to the other, but you also see these very short excursions. 
and you see combined events where uh, you jump to the other state and you go back through several of these short excursions. So there clearly are two mechanisms at work. And we thought it was quite cute and we tried to well, get some insight into why this is happening. And the way we did that is to look at the phase space topology of our reduced two-dimensional system. So our two-dimensional phase space is defined by psi, so the phase difference between both modes, and theta, the relative modal intensity. And in this reduced phase space, you've got a stable node for the clockwise mode and the counterclockwise mode. And they're separated by a saddle point, and you can look at the dashed line is the unstable manifold of the saddle, and the solid line is the stable manifold of the saddle. Now, the stable manifold, the, 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 uh, it determines the basins of attraction <coughs> of both solutions. So if we did give that color coding, you get something like this, where all points in the black region are attracted to the clockwise mode, and all points in the gray region are attracted to the counterclockwise mode. And as you can see, all these basins of attraction are quite tangled up into each other, and this is, lies at the basis of the, why these peculiar short excursions uh, occur. And so we'll use this to explain that. For instance, assume that you're operating here in the clockwise mode. If you've got spontaneous emission noise, the noise at a certain point will drive you outside of the basin of attraction, close to the saddle point, and you relax to the, uh, well, the, the, uh, the counter-propagating modes following the unstable manifolds. So that's quite common, that's just an escape, a classical escape. And if we look at the, well, that trajectory, the time trace corresponding to that looks like this, and you can compare it with the experiment, and of course it's very similar because it's very classical. But we can use the same approach to, to, to explain these events. So in the numerics of the full rate equation model or the reduced rate equation model, it doesn't matter. You see these type of events. And as we now have insight into this two-dimensional phase space, we can project it, the trajectory that corresponds to that. And you can see that these short excursions are nothing else than the diffusion between these stable manifolds. You make an excursion in phase space before getting back or you can make several excursions in phase space before getting back to either one state, and those would be then these combined events. And, well, I'm sure many of you will, if you see this type of picture, you will immediately ask yourself if you see these type of spikes where the system is also excitable. So that's something uh, I want to uh, spend the rest of my time uh, talking about. And the typical picture of excitability, I would say, is that you've got just one stable resting state, you've got a, a saddle nearby and the stable manifold of that saddle defines some kind of threshold so that when you cross that threshold you follow uh, the unstable manifold of the saddle and you make a large excursion in phase space before getting back to that one stable state and you have the spike. Now in our case of course this is not the same because well the unstable manifold here connects to a second stable state so you don't have that. And so in order to go a bit more to that picture, what we did is to break the symmetry in the laser. So we want to break the symmetry so that we don't have the two stable states anymore. The way we do that is again by playing with the, the linear coupling strength. So we made the linear coupling between both of the modes asymmetric. So we weakly break the inherent Z2 symmetry of the laser. And if we do that, what happens is if you break the symmetry, of course one mode is favored and in this case, this is the, the counterclockwise mode, and the basis of attraction of that mode is way bigger than that for the clockwise mode. And in fact, the basis of attraction of the clockwise mode is now so small that I would call it metastable. If you have, you can, if it's small enough, uh, it will become of the order of the size of the noise diffusion wing, let's say, of the spontaneous emission noise. So in an experiment, you will never see uh, a, well, a, a stable residence in this state because it will immediately be driven outside of this basin of attraction. So virtually you just have one stable state. So if you look at this picture, what you can do is of course you still have this threshold defined by a stable manifold, which you can cross, and then the system sees itself forced to make a large excursion into phase space before getting back to this one stable state. So time trace of that is just of course a spike that corresponds <coughs> to the intensity that corresponds to that. So the answer is yes, these SRLs are uh, excitable. And the way you can cross this threshold is, of course, well, you can do it in several ways. 
uh, you just have to perturb the system. A possible way to do that is by using octal injection. But what, what I like to focus on now is that you cross this threshold by adding noise. And I would just shortly uh, I'd like to show you which kind of pulses you can get. Uh, the distribution of a single pulse that, that exists and how that, what that looks like. And I will show, short end by showing you some, some results on uh, inter-spike interval distributions. So here we've got some, uh, some experimental results. You get virtually, if you look at the time trace, you're always operating in that one mode, but every now and then you see the spikes. And what I did here is just to take out several of these spikes and where you can look at them. So you've got a single pulse, you can have a double pulse, you can have a pulse which has a double maximum, which is a bit peculiar. And of course, at this point, you won't be very surprised if I tell you that if you do simulations, you can reproduce this. And so these are the simulations that you can see. You get one pulse, two pulse, you can even have this double peak pulse and so on. And then we can interpret that again in phase space where you get one pulse, two pulses, and this corresponds to, well, as if the state is, the basin of attraction of the least stable state is still large enough to have some influence, you can get trapped there for a very short while, and then you get this type of, uh, of pulses. Okay, sure. What are you putting in the, in the lower? The, the lower is, is again the, the phase phase. So in this case of the model? Of the reduced model. The of the, of the model with noise. Yeah, absolutely. Could you? Is it possible to, to plot the, tra the trajectory of the experiment? I mean, one of the variables is the ratio between the amplitudes. And definitely you can, you can plot this. What is the, the other variable? Is? Uh, the other variable is the phase difference between both modes, which is harder. Uh, it, it would be very nice if we could do that. Um, we thought about it, but up to now we, we didn't manage it. It would be interesting. Uh, there, yeah. In normal physiological excitability, neurons and so on, they define the refractory time. This is the time in which the system cannot be excited again. Yeah. But from your, I mean, from the second and the third degree, it seems that the mm -hmm. refractory time is, is maybe not a well-defined concept in your model. I, Can you estimate or say that maybe it's well, the, the most zero? Or? The, the, the thing that is closest to a refractory time, I would say, is, is just the, the travel time here. But as long as you're traveling, it, it, well, here you, it will be nicely defined in general. But if you have a, an excursion that comes close to, to, to the stable manifold, the noise can always drive you inside, so you can excite a different kind of pulse in that way, or an extra pulse, as I will show you later. So it's, it's not that during that time you can't excite the new pulse. So a related question, if you go back to the to the to the other slide. Yeah. So you you I mean this experiment, this is numerics. In the numerics, I mean can you obtain for instance the, like the third event in which it seems that this excited really, I mean it's kind of more of a splitted pulse rather than two other uh, is it can you think that what without mean? noise? I mean, <coughs> Deterministic dynamics in the model? What, this one? Yeah. No, 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 that's only due to noise. Okay. Deterministically, you will always follow the phase space around and get back. So, uh, it's only if you can cross the barrier due to noise. To, to the other fixed point, I think. Completely agree. Okay. Um, so, what I did here is to study just a single pulse, and we, I collected, uh, this is numerical. And I collected millions of events and I superposed their trajectory in a histogram here in this plot, again in the two dimensional phase space, or at least half of it. And you can see here the trajectories that are most likely followed by these excited pulses. And what's interesting to notice is that there's a, a whole band of structures that, you know, of, of pulses that can be, well, excited. And if we take all these pulses and we analyze the width and the height of these pulses, you can see that there's a very clear correlation between these two. Yes? Can you explain again the left finger? I don't okay, so understand what is, what is coded in color. Okay, so what, what I'm uh, plotting here is, let's say, half of the phase space, because I defined a threshold mm -hmm. from, for the pulse. Uh, so theta is, again, relative mode intensity, the phase difference. 
And so these are all the spikes, but the, the trajectories they follow in phase space. So the lightest, so the, the more yellow, that's the most likely traje trajectory that the, the pulse will follow. So what you can see is here's the saddle point. Most of the time you cross here this, this barrier further away from the saddle point. Well, I understand yep. that there is a highlight, right? I don't understand the highlight. Uh, here? Yeah. Well, that's due to the, the flow of the system that it, 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 well, it contracts more or less over there. It's, yeah. it's, I will show you here that uh, it is right. almost purely that there is. But that has to do with the time, with the time spent in that surrounding, the coral code? Uh, the probability. Yes. 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 It, it, it also means that it travels slower. Ah, so that's, that's what I wanted to know. Okay. It's so you've got more points than it's traveling there. Okay. So it's both the, the, the density with respect to probability, but also the timing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that otherwise should be all yellow. Yeah, but then not Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to say is that there's a clear correlation between the, the height and the width of the pulse. So the higher the, the, the pulse is, the more narrow it will be. And that's easy to understand from the flow of, of, of the phase space, because the higher the pulse is, the, that means it will uh, go further out in phase space. And if you analyze uh, the flow, it, the, 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 the pulse will travel faster over there. So the higher you go, it will travel faster and get back quicker, so it will be more narrow. And if you analyze that deterministically, you get this white line, which is a deterministic prediction. And, and so the with noise, this is just spread out. Um, and what I'm showing here is just the amplitude, the distribution of the amplitude or the height of the pulses, where you can see that they're distributed in a fashion. Oh, that I yeah. think has to do with the conservation law you mentioned before? Or? No. I don't think so. Not that I know. Must be conservation, conservation law that makes that the flux goes up. So the flux is faster, is narrower, so it's a concept quantity here that flow. So it's like a Hamiltonian conservative system. But um, I don't know whether it's related to the conservation law that yeah. power is conserved. Might be, might be something else, yeah. There's, well, there's, well, there could be some conservation. But the, the, the model has already. So you can impose this conservation, so all the trajectories, even if they are not pulses, are respecting this conservation. I think this is something else. So the, exactly. This has to do with the dynamics then. So yeah. The plane is floating, so already the plane of constant color. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, the only thing I wanted to mention here, it's, it's another uh, measure of the distribution of the pulses here of the width of the height, and here of the width, which is more asymmetrically distributed. So we took also these pulses and we took some experiments <coughs> and if we analyze the, the amplitude and the width of the pulses that we experimentally measure, you see a similar <coughs> correlation. So the higher the pulses are, the more narrow they are. <coughs> and so we also took the amplitude or the height of the pulses and it's more or less Gaussian, uh, distribu distributed in a Gaussian way. Here it's cut off because of the threshold we put to detect the pulses. But and here the width is more asymmetric uh, as we saw before in the theory, so that seems to match up quite nicely. And then the final thing I want to mention is something about the ISI distribution. So what we did is to both numerically and experimentally measure the time in between uh, excited pulses. And what you can then see is the following plot where I'm showing here well, the amount of pulses you've, uh, you've got and the function of the, the, the ISI. And you can clearly see that there exists two typical time scales. And the first time scale is, is a very general one. It's just a slow time scale that is a general Kramers type problem. You've got a particle in a potential well, and it wants to escape uh, if you have some noise, so it takes a certain time for it to escape from this potential well. So that, that, that explains this time scale. But this other time scale is really originated from the typical phase phase of the ring laser. And uh, I'll show you here now. So you have this longer waiting time to cross the barrier, but then you have your excited pulse. And during this relaxation of the, of the pulse, you come very close to the stable manifold or the threshold of excitability. And so noise can easily push you out again, push you over the barrier. 
and then excite the second pulse. So that would mean that in this way you get a re-excitation, so you get double pulse, a triple pulse, and so on. And so in this way, well, this explains the second time scale and just says that the second time scale is related to the time of flight of, 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 of one excursion. Um, yes, that's what, what I wanted to say. And then finally, I'd just like to make a few comments on the, the presence of these two time scales in the ISI, because it has also been observed in other systems. Uh, one example is, for instance, a semiconductor laser with alcohol feedback. If you're operating close to the low uh, frequency fluctuations, you get this, uh, the system is also excitable. So here I'm showing the density function of time, and you can see these power dropouts every now and then. And of course, this should be familiar because we saw it two days ago in the talk of Mickey, and we, we saw that this is actually not entirely correct because due to the low cutoff frequency, uh, well, it looks like this, but in fact, there's more going on than that. But if you analyze the ISI of such uh, a, a time trace, what you get is exactly such a bimodal distribution where you have here the long waiting time, but here also a, a different time scale. So you've got these two time scales in this picture. And the explanation that was given for that uh, can be understood by the phase phase in that, uh, in that case. And I'm just going to focus here on the region of the excitability where you have here a stable node, you've got a saddle point, and here a, a repulsor. <coughs> what happens is that from the stable mo nodes, you get well, driven outside across the stable manifold, and then you start your excitable excursion to get back. But in that case, you get at a certain point here, you get very close to the, uh, to the stable manifold of the saddle point, and so that's very similar as we, what we had. So in that case, if these come very close, noise can drive you across this barrier again, and you get a re-excitation of the pulse. So that's really the origin of these two time scales in the ISI. Of course, this picture for excitability is, is completely different from what we have in the rim laser, but this particular feature that takes uh, that leads to these two time scales can be present in, in different systems as well. And then another example can be find, uh, found in, in neuron models. If you take the, the Hodgkin Huxley uh, model, for instance, it's known that you can have a subcritical hot bifurcation. And in that case, what you have is an unstable limit cycle and a stable limit cycle. And if the stable node that is also present is, well, if they're configured in this particular way, what can happen is that, well, noise can drive you across this unstable, uh, unstable limit cycle which makes you jump on the stable one and then you start spiking but every time your spike comes around here noise can drive you back inside and relax back to the stable node uh, and this can keep on happening and it's very similar and if you analyze the ISI in this system you get exactly the same, you get the two times scales nicely and I think uh, <laughs> I would like to leave you with that and by just saying that I appreciate it, I, I thought the work was quite fun to do for, two, uh, for the reason that there was a nice interplay between theory and experiment. So we saw some experimental features, which we then tried to explain by numerics and some analytics. But on the other way around, the fact that we had that reduced model it allowed us to make some predictions about what was going to happen experimentally. So we could go back and look for that. And we also found several features. So that was nice. And well, there's some some conclusions here, but I think the main message is that we got a reduced model that allows to explain the excitability and multi-stability, and everything we see is actually due to the Z2 symmetry of the, of the ring laser, so these results can be applied to similar systems uh, which share the same symmetry. And if you want to read up on, on some of these results, uh, here are some references.
it seemed that the, there was no peak in the lower time space, but now, so I, it, so I would expect that you have a peak and not a, a, a sharp decay. Is this sort of behavior at the... It's because of uh, the binning. It's uh, if I take, if I, because here you need larger bins. Uh, if I would zoom in on this part, and if I take a finer binning, you will see a peak. More or less like uh, like in this case, where here, I, I also my picture was in log scale, which also, well, you, here you've got the exponential. This, this phenomenon, uh, um, that's something that happens for strong nodes. Should not happen for, for a small nodes. That's the yeah. There should be a Depen fair. Depends on the parameters and the proximity of, of your two of your trajectory, yeah, trajectory exactly. and your goes to the phase space feature. Of this one? Yeah, anyone, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But also you. So here basically you have the Kramer's time to scale from here, that's one time scale, and then you have this other time scale to say that here you jump over again. Yeah. But yeah, um, here you have some probability to jump that depends on how long does it takes over this this trajectory piece of trajectory. And this is very yeah, fast. Yeah, it's it's how long you you stay very close to each other and yeah. how close you are completely. Exactly, of combination of those. So probably if, if, if this is very fast and the noise is not too big, you don't see this. Or le or less. Or the way. Yes. So you should have a threshold somehow to observe this. Well, well, you, you can go down. Well, like this is a continuous. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it should be very rare. It should become. It should have some sort of coherence, some sort of, of resonance, and you. Yeah, and then if the noise, noise becomes noise. Too, too large, you can uh, jump in and yeah, jump exactly. back out. Yes, and set that to you will probably have some kind of resonance. So. Exactly. So, uh, That's the question to this okay. distribution. How far are really those cases comparable? Can you, can you go to the LLF case? Uh, this is, yeah. Um, yeah, where you, uh, to the uh, ISI. Okay. Where you actually see also the, the suppression after the peak. Which means uh, probability here? is reduced there to some, for, for some reason, while in the case of the ring lasers, you didn't see that. But you should probably see it according to your explanation. That, that you what, you, what you see is in the ring laser. Can you go back to the, now to the, to the other one? Because yeah. there, you, you don't see any suppression. But in your face space picture, you saw that you get close to the boundary where you say the likelihood of another excited, exciting another pulse is higher. Mm -hmm. But then again, you would move away from it, so your uh, probability should be reduced. No? You, you haven't reached the, the steady state yet, which defines the, the escape from the mm -hmm. uh, potential well. Uh, but um, so so I don't get the things together that this really uh, I, I think it explains the ro the. <coughs> The, 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 the focus type of behavior in your face space. So there's no suppression at, uh, after the Well, it depends state. again, maybe it's uh, similar as with video. I remember if I plot it on a, on a linear scale and if I reduce it to binning, that you can have a peak and then slight dip and then a, a crest again. So yeah. you do have similar. You cannot compare it to plots here, it's not the same thing. Because so the other, uh, other alternative well, is that the damping is much stronger than, than you indicate in your face based plot. No? That you return to your fixed point much faster uh, than having several loops around. Can you see this? Uh, if the yeah, why sure. uh, Can you show the face based picture? You show this nice rotation around. Uh, mine, you mean? Or? Yeah. This okay. one. Yeah. So according to your, your findings, you wouldn't have these, these focus-like several rotations about the fixed point before the turn. You see, if this is a focus, if this is of the focus was a fixed point, so yeah. that you go directly to the, to the data oscillations around, but you, you would not observe that. And no, that case, if that happens, you wouldn't observe that. In the, in the other case, this, this, this mechanism was not here, was here. Hmm. But the, yeah. the, the, yeah, it, it was, the, let's say, in the long discussion that you saw the oscillations around that thing. So somehow, in that in the other case, you were showing jumpings here. No, well, you, you, here. you will have here. You will have a combination of both because also when you get here, the noise can drive you here, and you you can go already like cross the boundary here. It doesn't need to happen here. It can happen at different places. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, I'm not yeah, sure whether that uh, answers your question or not. <laughs> okay. okay. I would say that in the in the case of excitable systems, with noise, you can depending on the parameters, you can have. 
the interspike distribution with one peak, with two peaks, with three peaks, with four peaks, depending on the amount of that. And, then, and probably what you, the, what you see is only in the case of one, one single peak, mm -hmm. and not the corresponding is not. Okay, yeah. but but we don't have the example with two peaks that you have shown. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay, it's the only one of them. Okay. And the final part of the question is that the, the, there, is, there are classical experiments on a system which should be completely similar to this, which is the, the ring laser, but the, the gas ring laser, <coughs> a big uh, laser with two saccharides in the has to. What is different here um, from that system? Well, in general, for the other ring lasers, uh, they need much more complex models because they need to. Uh, if you have two, uh, the two modes, they far, form a carrier grating. Well, well, of course, in gas lasers, they don't, but they. Uh, I'm thinking about something that. I think I'm going to study the. Is it too similar in that case? Sorry. The equations, I think, are the same, so I don't know. It's the same thing. But what is the. What is different? For gas I should check the parameters uh, where they're working. I don't dare to say. For the solid state uh, ring lasers, I know that there's a big difference because in that case you've got the carrier grating that is formed and that couples both modes and so you need a more complex model to describe the dynamics. And here that is washed out. But for gas lasers, I should check. Okay. So thanks for coming. Let's send the letter again.